I'm really excited that we have a nice mix of um, those who are still in training, some practicing positions, so we can really get um, a very different perspective today. So, and thank you all for uh, those who submitted questions that we'll be asking. We're gonna talk about communication and outreach methods, as well as job postings and searching, um, virtual and live interviews, and then, you know, the $10,000 question, what are those many, 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 many? So, uh, we're gonna dive right in. Um, yeah, and please feel free guys, whoever wants to field a question, okay? Um, recruiters use various types of outreach methods, such as text, email, phone calls, and social media. So I'll open it up to you guys. Which do you prefer? Not all of us. <laughs> um, so I prefer email. I think it's uh, like the most likely that I'm gonna respond to it, um, just because I'm not looking at text messages from numbers that I don't know um, when I'm working all the time, especially as a second year resident. Um, so I respond within a timely manner within 48 hours, usually with an email. Uh, phone calls I don't ever answer, and text messages I don't usually respond to, uh, especially if I don't know you on a personal level. Great, thank you, Trevor. Anyone else? I agree. I would say that email is the most preferred method because it allows me to look at you know, communications in my own major as opposed to text, which may or you have to vet and, and uh, you might be a little bit um, unwary of opening them my own Yeah, I would uh, pity you back over both of them. I would say emails, at least initially in the process, is definitely preferred with all the products I was um, going on. Uh, but yeah, they end up the process and text and uh, phone calls are definitely more acceptable. So once they've made the initial contact via email, then you guys are open to having conversations on the phone and then actually texting your personal line, things like that. Yeah. Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, so let's move into social media a little bit. So Clint and I get requests all the time from providers to connect with us on LinkedIn specifically. Um, do you use social media, specifically LinkedIn for recruitment, and do you actually connect with recruiters on there? Or if they reach out to you, do you accept those connections? Hi, can you hear me? Um, I would say that I think in medicine we're a little lagging behind on using LinkedIn compared to like the corporate world. Um, so I definitely don't see as many of my colleagues, residency fellowship or even as attendings utilize LinkedIn. I think um, when we sign up for recruiting websites, we get a lot of email leads through the recruiters, and I think that's primarily where we start our search. Um, however, I do think it would be nice to recruit, um, for you guys to recruit us through LinkedIn and to kind of like um, chat through the LinkedIn feature. Um, however, I don't know that it's being utilized as much in our field as it is in other fields, but I do think it's a great way for us to like set up a profile, put in all information, and have access. Does anyone use any other type of social media platform for recruitment specifically? You guys are making TikToks. <laughs> Bring me here. I'd like to work for you now. <laughs> so um, let's pivot then to email since we're talking. The email seems to be preferred method of communication here. So what would be, this is a two-part question, what would be the top thing or things in a subject line that you would like to see that would actually prompt you to open the email, and then conversely, what's going to prevent you in a subject line from opening an email? Um, I get a lot of emails through recruiters, and I would say the biggest things that people usually put in a subject line that helps is the salary, and then also the location, um, as well as what type of the position it is. So like whether it's a hospital position, or um, more locums, or um, something more like long-term. So I think that really helps you when it's just quickly in the subject line. I think for me, location really matters at this stage in my career. I've been studying for so long and I just kind of want to settle somewhere be around my family. So if the location is not ideal for me, the chances are I probably won't even look at that email. Um, I know certain websites will have you select the geographic area that you're interested in and that's really helpful for me. Um, but sometimes I'll get emails outside those geographic ranges and I don't know that I'm as interested in that just because I'm not willing to move at this point in my career. Anyone else? 
I would say that for the separate lines that typically catch my interest, it'll list the name of the position, the location, and the salary. And then as far as things that would make me not want to open as much, if it uses too many capital letters, or sometimes I've seen some with emojis, <coughs> sometimes we can, you know, we're always Yeah. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Thank you for that. Um, so, and I believe one of you touched on it about different types of recruitment. So Practice Match here, we host multiple focus groups throughout the year to help understand the ever-changing landscape of what physicians actually go through during the recruitment process. And I'm curious, if, you know, how much do you guys know the recruitment space and the differences between in-house recruitment, a locums company, um, and a firm for recruitment? Do, like, do you guys know the differences between those? Absolutely no idea. <laughs> So in-house recruitment, so if you're an in-house recruiter, raise your hand, most of our room here today. So that means that they're working for the hospital or healthcare company directly and they can recruit you directly. Um, we have some agencies outside, um, a local agency is some wonderful partners of ours, and that's more of the temporary placement work. And then uh, placement firms are, what's the word I want to use, Clint? So secondary help there. So we were just curious, trying to get, kind of get the pulse a little bit of what we know. Nobody knows. So you just wanted me to lose my dollar. That's what she wanted. I did. We had a bet that I, how long it would take me to talk. So she, she tricked me. So the idea of asking that question would be, how much education do you think we need to put into that, into your your guys' field, you know, to help educate, you know, president, fellow, and doctors, you know, to help with the landscape. Yeah, I can comment on that. I would say in residency, I don't really think that I ever got educated on that. Maybe that's why we as a group don't really know much about it. Um, we definitely have recruiters come by, but other than speak about maybe positions in the area, I don't think um, maybe there wasn't a focus on like actually educating on different types of recruitment, but I think that would be really helpful for us to know, um, especially if we were looking to reach out to certain people to find something that fits for our future career needs. Okay, we're gonna pivot now to job postings. Um, so similar to the email question, job postings obviously have a subject line typically. And if you're actively searching through a website and you're looking at job postings, what would you need to see in the subject line if it's different than what you've already mentioned with the email to catch your attention and what's gonna have you scroll past? I would say similar, the location and the salary. Sure. Um, for me, I'm in radiology, so my location would be remote. That would be a good idea. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it would be similar. Same thing, you know. Yeah. And that makes sense. Um, so, sorry. I agree. Uh, my uh, preferences would be the same for the two. Mm -hmm. Which makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's say we get to a job posting, we click on it. What do you actually want to see in the posting? Because we practice match my account managers. We tell our clients all the time we want to make sure that we give you the most specific information we can to pare it down. But I'm curious, you know, would you prefer to see information about the RVUs, comp, benefits, a more broad description of the actual responsibilities of the position or both? I think initially when I look at an email, I look for kind of the structure of the division, um, how much inpatient versus how much outpatient it is, and then definitely like what is the um, weekly schedule, so is it Monday or Friday, does it involve weekends, is there a call involved, kind of a quick summary on that um, after, of course, the aforementioned things where we talked about location and all that. Um, I think that would have been the first step, and then the second step is, okay, is this something that fits my lifestyle? And then from there is when I would probably want the nitty gritty on our views and you know, specific compensation details. Um, I think maybe, especially also because we're not ed educated as well on that part of the job throughout residency and training, um, some of that stuff can get a little overwhelming. It's surprising how many of my colleagues, including me, um, how limited our knowledge is on like, things like compensation benefits, our reviews, how to bill, how to code, all that stuff comes much, much later, and it's more something that we learn 
on the job. Um, even in fellowship now, which is um, one year away from being attending, I still um, don't really have a good grasp on that. And I feel like that's something that I'll struggle with a little bit to understand even now. So um, I feel like those details maybe I wouldn't really understand or matter too much to share. Yeah, uh, just piggyback on that. As a hospital, it's definitely the two main things I would look for is that the compensation and total package. And then the other thing would be the schedule that in seven on seven, not 12 hour shifts, and that's very important in my book. Sure. What would you guys consider a red flag in a job description? Um, one thing that I've noticed in some of my recruitment emails is when they say the location, like in the heading, and then throughout the body, it'll say, like, oh, it's like actually two hours from mm -hmm. the city that feels like manipulative. definitely like over promising and then the body of the email like under delivers uh, compared to the subject line that's always kind of disappointing and then you start to recognize some of the emails or some of the names that do this and then it's an automatic delete after that as harsh as that sounds just because you don't want to read the, spend the time reading the whole body of the email just to be disappointed about certain things that were maybe sugar coated sure so you, when we talked about you know obviously wanting to see information on the comp and what your day looks like in that initial outreach, do you care if there's kayaking nearby, or lovely hiking trails, or you know anything that's going on in the community? And if again, you know, you're a radiologist, and do you want to know how many babies they're delivering at the hospital every year? Or they put all of that information in, or do you really want it focused? Or do you guys like some of the extra information about the organization and the area and you know the community and what's available? Personally, I like the extra details about lifestyle and hobbies that people have. Um, it shows that extra thought was put into it, and then it gives me a, you know a sense of what to expect. You know, if I were to take the position um, and what my my outside work life would look like. I think um, definitely for me, it personalization goes a long way. So if you were to look at my profile on any of these websites and kind of cater the job searches to me um, and have my needs kind of reflected in the email, that would make a huge difference. Um, I think if I were somebody who didn't really care about the area or whatever, I would love to go anywhere and all those details would be really helpful. But if I already had a pretty set location in mind, it wouldn't really strike me any differently. Um, I just want to also add that it's similar to how we sometimes reach out to like residency programs or fellowship programs during our match. We don't just send like an auto email to every single program because based on many other people's experiences, it's um, shown that that's not very successful. So it helps to kind of cater to the program that we're trying to match to. Hey, I love this location because my family is nearby um, and I want to settle here or something like that. So the reverse would be also true if you were to let me know, hey, I know you're working in this area, like here's a position that's close by what we're looking to. That would really help me. Great. Thank you. So let's uh, pivot again to interviewing. So we've seen, obviously, a dynamic shift post-COVID. Um, there's still a major split between virtual and in-person interviews. So do you guys have a preference for an initial interview and then a site visit? Would you rather these things continue to be virtual, or do you like the in-person component? Um, I like both. So um, when interviewing for uh, residencies, they were a lot of virtual, which was nice because it saves a lot of money on travel and stuff. Um, so I think for the initial visits, it's, it's very appropriate, but we definitely want to do it for like a second one. Sure. Well, I'm happy. When I matched, I matched to the one place that I had an insight in interview at, like an in person interview, and all my other interviews were virtual, so that goes to show how much of a difference that made for me. But I agree, I think if it's something that you're just lightly considering, maybe a virtual interview is more appropriate, but if you're really invested and you want to go there, definitely need a site visit. 
Yeah, I think uh, offering um, either option is uh, helpful just because the one place I matched for residency was the only place that I interviewed at in person for uh, residency. I had um, a ton of virtual interviews, but I just felt like maybe I didn't um, feel the landscape of the whole atmosphere there. So that's why I picked the residency that I did. Um, I also prefer the model where the first uh, component is the interview. Um, and the second one is the site visit. And then with the interview, the virtual um, part is a little bit more preferred over the in-person, but they both are equally feasible. Great. Yeah, I kind of both are valid, but in my case, I think um, in-person would be better. You just get a more in-person feel of the program and you get to talk to everybody sure. to help make that decision. Sure, so let's talk about that in-person visit. So we do an in-person site visit. What are the most important things for you to see and who is the most important person or people for you to meet while you're there? Um, I don't know about most important, but it would be very important for me to see is I'd like to definitely meet some of the support staff, some of the employees like technicians, transporters, um, and nurses. Um, I think their practice and, and happiness of wherever we're at is extreme, they're extremely important for what we do. And I've worked in a lot of places where they're very like overworked, understaffed, and it like really inhibits what we do. So um, especially like on site, I would like to catch them in the moment, see how stressed they are, and how happy they are working at that place. That's a great point. Thank you. I think um, initially, before going to residency fellowship, I would have probably said like the physicians that I've been working with, and while that does matter, I think definitely the practice manager in an outpatient setting is probably the most important person for me to meet. Um, usually the practice manager is at the center of the chaos. They're the ones dealing with everything from the painting of the building to how the patients are set up throughout the day, and I would want to have a candid conversation with the practice manager about how they like their job, how they like the physicians that they work with, what is the culture at the workplace that they're at, um, and basically what they rate their quality of life and the quality of life of the whole practice that would be most important to me. I agree with what's been mentioned regarding you know, outpatient uh, components that are most, in, yeah, most important to see. I would like to add that for the inpatient setting, the things and places I'd be interested in seeing would be the actual unit where I would work, the support staff that work there, um, the physician's charting area, and uh, the lounge, um, and also maybe be able to meet somebody who's working uh, as a coworker and see what their their day day to day is like. Great, thank you guys. So <clears throat> obviously, culture is important. Your support staff and their happiness day-to-day -day is important. Conversely, their unhappiness would be a red flag. Um, what else would you consider a red flag going on site? And also, do you feel any part of the site visit is unnecessary? Um, so I think Definitely seeing the place that we'll actually be working can be really helpful. Sometimes site visits include a lot of um, tours of like hospital administration areas that we don't really end up going to as much. Um, so I don't know that that would be helpful. Again, um, catering it to the site that you'll be working at is really important. So if we're gonna do something inpatient, I would wanna see the inpatient facility, like where's the cath lab, where's the ED, you know, all of those things. But if I was at an outpatient setting, I wouldn't really care to know much about what's going on in the hospital. Like I pick up patients for a reason. Unless, of course, I was seeing consults in the hospital, in which case I would definitely want to know. Um, and sometimes you can be affiliated with one site, but then a lot of your time spent is at another site. So then seeing the sites that you're affiliated with um, doesn't really help. It's actually really, you know, where you'll be working day to day that you really want to see. Sure. So then I'll actually follow up with that shiny if I can. So if you are doing outpatient, maybe you are working at three, four, or five different locations, to see all of them, would you even want that try to cram it into one day? Would you want to stretch out your site visit over a couple of days to like really take your time and kind of immerse yourself in each of those locations? 
That's a great question. So when I started fellowship, I didn't expect this, but I go to seven different clinics right now, which is a lot of driving and a lot of different places to go. But I'll be honest, I only saw at my site visit day the clinic that I would work uh, in the majority of the time, which is three days per week, and the other clinics I didn't really get a chance to see. And it honestly didn't really make a huge difference to me because a lot of them are set up similarly, and I primarily just wanted to see the sites where I'd be there the most. Sure. Thank you. Any other red flags on a site visit that you guys have experienced um, or anything else that you would feel unnecessary? Okay. So let's move on to our next topic. Compensation, bonuses, benefits, stipends, the fun stuff. So I'm gonna take a little poll um, and I'm gonna ask you guys to give me a show of hands and I'll give you your options first. So what is most important to you regarding compensation? Option A will be loan repayment, option B is the sign-on bonus, option C is the annual guarantee. So if the most important is loan repayment, get them up. We've got one, thank you very much, Trevor. Um, the sign-on bonus, the annual guarantee. There it goes, <laughs> excellent. Um, <coughs> So as we start to see, and we're gonna kind of pivot in um, with salary transparency, and I don't know how much you guys know about salary transparency laws, and that's really kind of coming into play for us. Um, how do you feel like, where does that rank when you're having a conversation in regards to a new opportunity? You know, when, when we start talking about salary, is that something that you need to know right up front before you will consider having that conversation or a secondary conversation? Or is that something that can be negotiated throughout the process? I would say the first option out of the two would be my preference. Um, knowing what to expect going into uh, you know, further proceedings with actual um, interviews as well, so would be you know, what I would appreciate the most. That being said, the second option is also um, doable if if I really like you know the geographic location or what else the, the place has to offer. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's most important is just the transparency and um, just knowing a certain number um, and then not having it be something that's oversold to you with like the addition of certain bonuses that you may or may not get or things that you may or may not be eligible for. I would just want the fair number and even if it's lower than I expected, if that not final number ended up being close to what I was seeing initially, then I would be more than happy with it. I think um, the culture of like over-promising, under-delivering, under or giving you false expectations, um, that part is where I kind of don't like. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think it's just you want to have a ballpark range going in, so and then everything else is negotiable after that, depending on your preferences. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because even when we talk about compensation, you know, if you were planning on relocating, that gets factored in as well. Um, so when we're seeing quite a trend where providers are moving more and more and more to go back home, um, as Shine had mentioned, or closer to your family. So what do you guys think the importance of an organization offering um, a robust relocation platform and assistance with that process? Do you think that could be something that you would find useful versus, hey, we'll see you here on the 10th, best of luck, <laughs> figuring it all out? I would say that's pretty favorable um, from, that, from uh, my uh, opinion. Um, I would say that when comparing two positions and one offering the location assistance and the other one, then I would prefer the former. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Everyone's on board with that. So is there anything else? Those were my questions. We're gonna get ready to open it up to the group here, so get ready, guys. Um, but doctors, is there anything else from a recruitment standpoint that you have made may have experienced throughout your time, good, bad, otherwise, that you might like to share with the group? Things you liked about being recruited, things you didn't like, anything like that? I did remember one more thing that related to the questions you asked earlier. Um, 
if I see an email that has doctor dot last name or it was obviously there was a placeholder that's another um, <coughs> I like when um, certain fees are just closed up front, so some recruiters will charge for their services because they work independently. And I like being able to know um, if that is involved and whether or not that's something I would want to pursue. So I'm not really sure. Um, Thank you. Thank you for answering our preloaded questions here, so to speak. And now I would love to open it up to the room. Does anyone have a question for any of our wonderful providers up here? Hey, Nicole, we have a question over here. Thanks, BK. So I have a question in regards to interviews. Um, we talked about what happens on site, but we put a lot of effort into recruiting tours, dinners. Are those things important to you? Is it nice or sort of added um, time that you don't really need to spend in the process? Um, yeah. I Social dinners, social lunches, especially if um, other people in the practice show up, it shows like a good, um, welcoming like, environment that people are happy and, and proud of their work. So, yeah, I think that's very good. I agree. I would say it, they are nice, and it has the added benefit of you know, talking to other people in a more relaxed setting, and it does show effort um, put into uh, the planning of the, of the um, event. So, uh, yeah, I've always um, appreciated this. So um, I'll piggyback on that really quickly. So with that, you say to have some colleagues, is there anyone in particular that you would like to spend time with um, in that type of atmosphere versus a you know, more formal interview? Mm -hmm. I think um, it's, again, similar to how we talked about the different people involved in the inpatient and outpatient setting. So primarily the people that you're going to be working with the most, um, maybe less useful for like hospital administration and people like that to be there because they don't really interact with them much, but really to be given the opportunity to create a connection with people that you might be working directly with um, in the near future. And that's always a great opportunity and it kind of leaves you a good taste in your mouth when you go back home about the position and about what you expect from the job. Sure. Thank you. So you may have just answered part of this, but I wanted to kind of delve in a little bit deeper. So our hospital administration, even in the outpatient world, they're very interested in talking to our candidates. They want to, you know, wow you and everything. Do you find that, especially in the outpatient world, do you find it irritating that the administrators want to meet you and spend a half hour talking about how wonderful the organization is, or is that okay? can be twofold. Um, I think in some regard, you do want to know a little bit about the organization, their mission, and what they stand for, but it can get tiring pretty quickly because what you really care about at the end of the day is your impact personally in that organization and how your role could fit in with the larger mission of the organization. And I think that I would be more keen to know my daily responsibilities and the people that I'm working with on a day-to-day -day basis a little bit more than um, the larger system, though it is important to know kind of the general values and the mission of the system because I don't want to work somewhere where I'm not aligned with the values. I think depending on how it's structured within the site visit, like if it's a quick meeting with admin, um, it's not necessarily something that's okay, that part of the day. I understand it's part of the <coughs> overall process. So as someone who's in a specialty where it's also hybrid, you could do outpatient, in, uh, outpatient uh, visits, um, or I can also do inpatient consults. Um, I think it, it is relevant at least to, to meet the that. Oh, okay, How comfortable are you all talking to a recruiter about potential other offers or other places that you're interested in? And if you're not very comfortable, what could the recruiters do to make that easier for you to discuss with them? Personally, I don't see an issue with that. And if a recruiter brought up an alternative position to me, I would view that as positive in terms of being able to broaden my search. 
Yeah, I would really just want the recruiter to work with me um, on my needs per se. So if I mentioned that I wanted to be in a particular location, I wouldn't want like something outside of that to repeatedly be brought up because you know I already maybe said that I wouldn't be interested. So I think as long as there was that open communication where I felt like I could express my needs and those were being listened to, then I really wouldn't um, mind having any sort of discussion about the position that would come up. stage in your um, education did you begin your job search and when is the I guess latest that you would want to be able to lock up an opportunity for yourself? Uh, so I'm, I'm two years or a little bit less than two years out from ending residency and uh, no um, so like one to one to two years is appropriate and if I was um, I was closing in, closing in on like a few months in the residency and I didn't have a close position locked up, I'd be worried. So I'd say like one to two years uh, towards the end of residency. If I could take you back on the I was just gonna say, I think it depends um, if you're in residency or fellowship or what stage you are in getting to that attending position. Um, so like the match we apply well before a year in advance and start thinking about it a long time before. Um, and so we're kind of accustomed to thinking about things very early. Um, I think if you have like a visa situation where you have other things to kind of consider in your job search, then you would start looking even earlier, like two years prior to you actually getting the position. I'm gonna piggyback off of Courtney's question. So I, I think what we're asking is, we as recruiters are talking with you about our positions and trying to be as transparent as we can about our offers and what we have available. How can we gain that trust with you all so that you can say, yeah, I'm looking at a position at Joe Smith you know, University Hospital and they're offering me this, or to really try to gain that foundation of trust so you can feel that you can be transparent about maybe where we're not meeting your needs. Yeah, I think that's a good just um, and maybe like building up that familiarity with each other and kind of just getting to know each other a little bit more. I think like with any trust or relationship, you just kind of want to um, have some comfortability and feel like you're able to express your needs with that person. So I know for, for myself, um, there are certain people that I speak with from a recruiting standpoint who I've known for a very long time who reach out intermittently whenever they have a position that fits my needs. And so those people I've built up trust with because I know that they keep my interest in mind and they always reach out to me whenever the time is appropriate. So I really think it just takes time just like any other good relationship. And um, sometimes we're really busy and we can be bad with replying and things like that. Um, so in those situations, I think, even though it's maybe annoying to you guys, I think I would just um, appreciate maybe a little bit more patience. You know, sometimes I have busy schedules, some days I just want to go home and not think about anything. And so, um, especially the job search process, because that's really intimidating. We've worked so long and so much, and now we finally get this opportunity to, you know, like get a real salary and get a real job and move on with our lives and start a family and all of those things. And sometimes the pressure of that can be a little bit overwhelming, and it's not that we're purposely trying to ignore you or anything. It's just a lot for us to take in, especially after a busy day. Um, it fills itself out and all of those things. So I think really just um, reaching out repeatedly helps, but not too much, kind of in a patient, Manner that definitely helps and just build up that friendship and that camaraderie with each other. That's great. Thank you, Sean. Does anyone on the panel feel any differently about that? Hi, my name is Kelly. Thanks for being here. It's really nice to be able to talk to you guys, and your insight is very valuable. So we appreciate that. My question actually comes from something you said early on, Sean, and I'm kind of interested in, in your opinions on it because it's something we don't do. But you shared that, um, you talked about, you've all talked about how important it is to understand the compensation and the work are being structured. Um, not really wanting to get into the details of the job posting, learn that more as you go through the process. One thing we don't, and you, you said that during training they're not educating you a lot on coding, which is important, right, when you're on a work are being structured. Um, something we don't talk about a lot, except on on-site interviews, and I'm thinking start this earlier in our process is we do um, education with our physicians when they start with us we need to have them sit down with a certified coding educator who specializes in your specialty within seven days of seeing the first patient is that something we should maybe talk about earlier on in our recruitment process do you think that would be is that something important to you that you would like to hear earlier on in the process possibly I would love that. Um, right now, I think uh, we have a third party 
coding group that actually monitors my notes and gives me um, a lot of insight into why I coded too high or too low. And, but it's all in the residency stage where I'm kind of monitored pretty closely. Um, so I think that I'm making little mistakes that could have made more money and they show me, you know, exactly how much I'm losing out on or overcharging and then if I get audited, stuff like this. So I think that that would be extremely beneficial for me, um, especially when I'm just starting out as an attendee. I'll say that's even more than I'm getting, um, even in fellowship, um, we're kind of just set to, you know, deal with it when it comes and you'll figure it out when you get there and that sort of thing. And that can definitely give you a little bit of anxiety because you see superiors to you kind of doing it and um, even still having some trouble with it. So definitely think um, integrating it earlier in the process would help, but I think it would have to be delivered in such a way that it wasn't too overwhelming or too disruptive to everything else that we have to do at that stage. And I don't know that I know the right answer on how to go about that. Uh, 
know when I graduate. Um, I don't really know what to expect or what to do. Uh, part of the reason that I came here was kind of going to the Family Medicine Conference and actually met a uh, couple up there, so um, so I came here. But uh, I don't really know what to expect or what to do, and if somebody was to guide me in that process, I think that that would be really beneficial for me. And to piggyback on that, so when you guys um, were going through residency, was there any education from your coordinator about what to expect, next steps, how to get your CV ready, anything like that? They're not in here, don't worry, they're not in here. <laughs> there wasn't, in my case, for residency, um, formal sessions dedicated to that. Now, during fellowship, we did have a formal CV review session. Um, but, you know, to answer that question, I do think that having tidbits of information, whether it's related to, um, you know, job hiring trends or um, interview tips, that would have hurt. And in many cases, it would probably be helpful. Yeah, I did residency in Cincinnati in a large um, healthcare group there. They had many recruiters um, who did an event with our residency program, and they had like food and games, and it was very chilled out, and there was no real pressure associated with it. And they were available there if you wanted to ask questions. They had information regarding job posting in the area. And it was, I remember uh, it was a very concise list of where exactly those jobs were, kind of a general structure on. Um, pay protocol and things like that, and they just had that on the table, but then there was an event that you could attend and there was no pressure really, and I found that was really helpful, and if I was working in the primary care field, which is what this event was set up for, I think um, that sort of method would have definitely attracted me to learning more. Um, the other thing that's really, really helpful, very, very helpful, is going to the residency programs, talking to the chiefs of the program, and seeing if they would be willing to work with you to set up an event at the program. I think that's really helpful. In internal medicine, every single day, almost, or different programs have assessed differently, but at least a few times a week, we have a one hour um, session, usually at noon, called New Conference, or we have a morning report, different programs structured differently. But during that time, we do a lot of education, but sometimes it's refreshing just to get a presentation about like career options, you know, um, things to think about when you're looking for a job search. So those tips and things that you were mentioning could be put in an email, those could even be presented kind of as a segue into um, marketing for your recruitment agency and marketing positions that you have. I think that would be really helpful and we already you know, have food and are just sitting there listening and you might not capture everybody's attention but the people that are interested will definitely listen and will definitely reach out to you if they are interested. That's great because you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. So getting that information sounds super helpful. That's wonderful. Hi. Oh, actually I have two questions. My first agreement is you mentioned the emoji is kind of a turn off or a, a red flag, um, which I totally get. Uh, but when you get an email, um, especially maybe an initial outreach email just telling you about an opportunity, would you rather it just be kind of text about that opportunity or do you like to see some pictures embedded, uh, maybe of the location or the clinic or a mix of things um, in that email or does it matter to you? Great question. I pretty much would say that um, it doesn't really matter in terms of the format, but I do like when it has a combination of both text and pictures. Does anyone not like pictures in the email? You just want a little, little blurb, little text? I think I like the idea of um, pictures of the actual facilities that you'd be using being included in the email. Um, you know, like pictures of like canoes or something that were Things I would maybe want to do, but not exactly what I'm thinking about, right? When I'm looking at that email, maybe not as helpful. Um, so it can be nice, but definitely just pictures of the facility. You have a second question? Yes. Thank you for that information. Shaking when I mentioned that. So I did have one reach out where um, half the fee would be paid prior to 
the job being secured and then half would be after. And that definitely caught me off guard because I haven't worked with anybody really in that space. Um, but I guess when I when that happened, I assumed maybe there were more people out there doing that. But I'll be honest, throughout residency, most of the recruiting emails I got did not involve anything like that. Typically, people work for the company that they represent or the recruiting agency that they represent, and their compensation is purely based on you know being hired and whatever compensation they get from the place that we're being hired to. But yeah, it definitely is out there because that's happened to me personally, and um, I definitely raised an eyebrow at it, and I don't know if it's somebody that I would continue with. Um, it was a specialty recruiter, so it was specifically for the field of rheumatology, and I don't know maybe if that's a field where things are done differently. I'm not too familiar, um, but I guess it's not common. So when we're looking at your on-site interview, are you interested in a full day, half day? Um, what's your preference? Great question. And we have um, Dr. Pat here with us, just joined. So please feel free. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I prefer half day. Uh, if it's going to be a whole day, it needs to be light with uh, some breaks uh, or a portion where <clears throat> there can be a break. You know, that's more so being stuck the entire day and then, you know, have not been able to catch up with, you know, calls or, or emails or even just take a break to get something to eat or go to the bathroom. So I have days nice, um, whether that's in the afternoon or the morning portion, it's preferred. Does anyone feel differently? Would you guys prefer a full day?
program that you work in is so they're not following you in for extra shifts that affect your personal lifestyle, not that they won't expect to go in. And, but so it's nice to have extra shifts if you're available, not that, but you don't want to be just called in um, uh, for emergency reasons when you won't expect to know. Uh, family medicine, uh, I chose the field specifically for the work-life balance. Uh, I think one thing that I always uh, would like to see is like how many days am I working in a typical week, so four days, some days, five days. Uh, but also the ability to increase my hours. Right now, you know, I don't have any children or anything, so I'm, I don't have, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of obligations. And so it's kind of nice to increase my work hours uh, for increased compensation at this time. And um, just taking more work versus life at that point. Yeah, so um, I'm a radiologist, so work-life balance is, is very important to me as well. Um, I like complete transparency about you know the number of reads of RPUs I'm expected to produce. So you know, like twelve thousand compared to like twenty thousand a year would depend a lot on that, and um, just transparency about like what specialties I'm supposed to be covering, how many days um, I'm on call, like remote versus on-site visits. Um, yeah, I consider all of that. Um, I'm a rheumatology, so it's an inpatient outpatient hybrid specialty in multiple centers, so I would want to know definitely um, what the clinic structure of the day is. So I prefer to basically do all my work at work, and then when I go home, just kind of be turned off for the day. Um, and I would prefer something that, you know, had just me seeing patients back to back to back, having a short lunch break, and then just going on about my day um, when I get home. The other two things that I would look for is the call schedule. So how often am I covering for other physicians? Um, how many weekends does that involve? How many weekdays does that involve? And then the other schedule, the scheduling thing that I would learn is consults. So we cover consults in the hospital at many sites, and so I want to know how much of my time am I spending covering consults and how much um, does that play into my schedule? Because consults in rheumatology, especially in other specialty fields, can take a long time, a lot of investigation, a lot of reading up on our part, um, and even communicating with other physicians as well. I also like the structure that some clinics have of having like an admin day or being able to take um, a day out of your schedule instead of seeing patients just to be able to work on like office related things. So in rheumatology, we approve a lot of specialty medications, there's a lot of prior ops, a lot of insurance denials, and you can have the best time in the office, but you'll still end up doing a lot of that work yourself just because sometimes the prior ops require you to get on the phone with the person approving or denying that particular claim. And so I would definitely want some time set aside for that because that takes a lot of hours outside of my regular work day. That's fantastic. Thank you guys so much. I believe, go ahead. Uh, I guess I'll get the last question. Yes, please. Thank uh, you. So we all know how important you all are, right, to run right, through the operations of our healthcare system. As such, we talk a lot about candidate experience both here today and through the training sessions that we've gone through. What's the most memorable component of your interview process or onboarding process, either negative or positive, that you guys can look up from? Just so we can maybe learn what's been impacted you. Great question. The most memorable portion of the interview or the entire process, if we, which, which is that your question? Your experience. Um, I, I would say it's I, I had a memorable experience where I actually was in this hotel here uh, eating at Corona's on the Gulf, and it was an amazing experience. Um, but my first interview for emergency medicine was with a group here locally, and we went to dinner here. It was fabulous, and we just blew the socks off all the other interviews because the interview ended around three or four. Dinner reservations were around 5.30 or 6. I was already put up in the hotel here, and uh, it was uh, uh, it was uh, night gala-esque. It was awesome. It, it was really cool, and I joined the group. Anyone else? Okay. So I would like to take a moment to thank all of our panelists for being here today. I know I found this incredibly informative. I think we're all going to go back to our computers and start tweaking email templates and job postings and get things situated. But again, I want to thank you all so much for your time and for providing us your feedback on your experiences. 
So let's give them a round of applause for you. We'll be getting started for the next session in just a moment. So thank you all again.